First of all, I would like to thank Campbell Collaboration for the opportunity to uh, present this webinar today. Uh, it's a real pleasure and, and a real honor to be with you. Uh, so thank you. Um, yeah, so the systematic review focuses on radicalization and family. And it's titled, Is Radicalization a Family Issue? Uh, and I will present the results of a systematic review of family-related risk and protective factors, consequences and interventions against radicalization. Uh, this systematic review has, be, has been published um, as a Campbell review together with my co-author uh, Elena Nasajsku. Uh, and uh, um, it has been funded by the Department of Homeland Security uh, of the United States. So thank you also to a big thank you to uh, the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, and it, it has been done through Campbell Collaboration. Mm. Yeah. So regarding radicalization, uh, there are many different studies on the topic. Uh, I think it is, uh, it is a topic that has been uh, in the media quite a lot recently. Uh, but of course, not everything that is called radicalization is actually radicalization. So uh, first of all, we need to understand what radicalization is and is not. Uh, so in this research field, most researchers agree that radicalization is a process uh, that is a complex process. It's a social with, with many different social psychological uh, variables that are involved in it. Uh, and it is a process through which people acquire a series of extreme beliefs, attitudes and ideologies, uh, justifying the use of violence to achieve goals, uh, to promote these ideologies. So basically, we understand radicalization as having a cause that is considered important and trying to defend this cause, to promote this cause through violence, supporting this violence or uh, perpetrating violence to defend the cause. And the truth is that some people hold radical beliefs while other people behave in a violent way to defend the cause. So basically, radical beliefs are not necessary or sufficient for becoming a terrorist. Uh, but it is usually assumed that individuals who engage in terrorism and radical violence in general uh, would show radical thinking first. So this is why most researchers in the field would agree that it's important to prevent or decrease radical thinking because this radical thinking can actually escalate to radical violence. Uh, and it is important to think of it as a process and focus on both um, thinking and behavior. So basically we would talk about cognitive and behavioral radicalization. So cognitive radicalization would be defined as support for or exp expression of willingness to commit violence to defend the cause. Whereas behavioral radicalization would involve also commission of violence to defend the cause. And there are different radical ideologies, uh, but uh, when thinking about conceptualizing this particular study, uh, we found that most research in the field would focus on extreme right radicalization, extreme left, Islamist, and also unspecified radicalization. And this is basically true for most studies in the field. So although it is possible to think of radicalization regarding different ideologies, these are the most studied, studied ideologies in the field. Uh, so um, on this slide, I have put some examples of items that were used in uh, the studies included in our systematic review uh, and meta-analysis uh, that, that measured those different ideologies uh, through different, different uh, instruments. So for example, uh, extreme right, an example of, of an item was an agreement with some what 
authors called provocative neo-Nazi slogans. So for example, Führer comment we will follow. Um, and people would, uh, participants would express their agreement with this, uh, the, this kinds of state, statesmen. Uh, then extreme left, so for example, hit and hurt someone, someone for being right wing. Mm, so people would, uh, participants would agree if they have done this or not. Uh, then regarding Islamist radicalization, there's uh, one example of an item here as well. So some people think that suicide bombing and other forms of violence against civilians uh, are justified to defend Islam uh, from its enemies. Other people believe that no matter what reason, uh, the, this kind of violence is never justified. Do you personally feel that this kind of violence is often justified to defend Islam? Uh, so this would be one item measure and participants would express their agreement or disagreement with this statement. Uh, and then there were several studies, um, there are many studies in the field in general, uh, that would measure uh, so-called unspecified or another type of uh, radicalization. So here is one example. Uh, so this would be mostly general. So for example, in the study, uh, Nivet and colleagues uh, would measure violence to fight against injustice, to defend the values, convictions, or religious beliefs, uh, support groups that use violence, fight for a better world uh, by using violence, or committing attacks, or kidnapping people. So basically what these measures have in common is that, again, there is a cause and it's defended through violence. Right, so what about the families? Well, uh, although families are studied in different fields, in psychology, criminology, other related fields, uh, and we know that family-focused risk and protective factors are important for different antisocial behaviors. So there are many, many research studies that have shown that. Uh, but there are still very important gaps in knowledge related to family and radicalization. Uh, but basically, why would family factors relate to radicalization? Uh, well, there are several reasons for that. Uh, and having analyzed those reasons, we, th those reasons, we decided to conduct the systematic review and meta-analysis. Uh, so there are several theories uh, behind this, uh, this idea, this possibility. So one of uh, those theories um, is based on social learning. Uh, so social learning basically means that people uh, would observe others and then imitate their behaviors. Uh, this is particularly true for young people, but it can happen at any age. Uh, and we know that parents are frequently treated as models of behaviors by children. Uh, children would perceive those behaviors, observe behaviors of their parents and then imitate them because they would understand that these behaviors can be uh, desirable, even if sometimes they are not. Then intergenerational transmission of antisocial behavior is a well-known phenomenon. It has been shown in many different studies. And the truth is that it doesn't necessarily only happen with parents. It can happen with other um, groups, other people. So in this case, other family members. It's also known that, for example, uh, delinquency among siblings uh, is quite common. So we know that, um, well, some um, children or some young people not, not necessarily young, but some people would observe uh, their siblings, other uh, people, or the other family members, and would imitate their behaviors. So we have a strong theoretical basis to think that, well, in this case, it's reasonable to suggest that uh, people would probably observe other people's behaviors and then imitate them. Uh, then another good reason to think that uh, families could be important for radicalization is that uh, from other fields, so there's uh, many different uh, studies, we know that parenting is important for later outcomes. So we know that parenting is related to mental health, to individual and social well-being, uh, which basically can become risk or protective factors for radicalization. So if this is the case, we should think, well, probably parenting is also important for radicalization. Uh, then based on social capital theories, uh, social capital um, is basically 
the structures that are uh, provided for people uh, to enhance some behaviors and dissuade other behaviors. Uh, so it's, it, it has to do with social support as well um, by different social structures. Uh, so in this case, within the social structures that are formed by families, we know that families are important uh, social structures. Um, and within those structures, if some family members are radicalized, uh, it makes sense to think that, well, in those families, probably pro-social actions could be dissuaded and thus antisocial actions could be promoted. So it definitely seems that families are important, that they can be important for radicalization, but what, why, why does it matter? Well, it does, uh, because family-related factors could actually be crucial to explain radicalization. Uh, but the truth is that most of the empirical studies in the field include limited numbers of participants and variables. Uh, and also families uh, are likely to be negatively impacted by radicalization. And given the importance of families for individuals and societies, uh, family-focused prevention and intervention programs against radicalization could be especially effective. But of course, evidence for those programs is crucial. Uh, so based on um, this theoretical framework, uh, we suggested three main research questions. So first of all, we wanted to discover what are the family related risk and protective factors for radicalization. Then we also wanted to know what is the impact of uh, radicalization on families. And we also wanted to know if family-based interventions against radicalization are effective. Uh, so basically what we wanted to do in this case is to include everything that would of course uh, be in agreement with our inclusion and exclusion criteria, but mostly to review the whole field of family and radicalization, including risk factors, protective factors, consequences, and interventions. Uh, so this is why we decided to uh, conduct a Camber systematic review. And I think it's important to, to take into account that Camber systematic reviews are uh, well, especially difficult to conduct, but at the same time, they are especially beneficial because Campbell systematic reviews have this very, very rigorous process uh, where what sometimes people in the field call Rolls Royce, high quality, top quality systematic reviews are produced. And Campbell collaboration is especially helpful with this, with that. So, uh, first of all, uh, we registered the title. So at that point, we, th we focused on the topic, we thought about what we were going to do uh, during the systematic review. Then uh, we registered the protocol, uh, which involves a lot of thinking and which involves establishing a methodology for a systematic review. Um, and the good thing is that Campbell collaboration and special thanks to the editors as well would provide feedback on all those stages. So if there is anything that is unclear, they would help. And this is very, very, very um, positive in a sense that uh, the systematic reviews have like beforehand um, ideas of how the systematic review will be conducted and then the result this is actually excellent. Uh, and then after the protocol was approved, we produced the review and again, we received feedback from Campbell. Uh, so what is a, a systematic review and a meta-analysis and why does it really make sense to conduct a systematic review and meta-analysis on this topic on, or on, on another topic? So why, why does it make sense? Well, Systematic reviews are very, very, very important because they can provide a global panorama of a field, which cannot really be obtained through empirical research. Because empirical research 
has limited number of participants and variables that can be included. And if the review is systematic, it would provide, it would be based on rigorous methods and objective results. There are also specific aims, self strategies, and inclusion and exclusion criteria. Studies are coded, and if a meta analysis is performed, overall effect sizes are calculated to statistically describe different phenomena. So, this is a big difference between what we call a narrative review, where researchers who are usually specialists in a field uh, would try to describe a topic from their own perspective. Sometimes they try to be as objective as possible, but still it's mostly their subjective choice. Whereas in a systematic review, the whole field global panorama is reviewed and readers have the opportunity to see what evidence is out there based on the whole scientific field. But in a systematic review and meta-analysis, it is absolutely crucial to be able, on one hand, uh, provide this global vision of a field. But on the other hand, it's very important not to mix apples and oranges, <laughs> while, we, while we call that, to, to, so to speak. So basically, it's important to establish specific inclusion and, inclusion and exclusion criteria to be able to tell that what we put together as a group of studies, uh, and especially when we calculate common effect size and overall effect size, that we are actually talking about one concept that is being synthesized. So having said that uh, this systematic review is quite is very comprehensive. Uh, so we searched 25 databases uh, and we also hand searched gray literature from April to July 2021. So it actually took us quite a long time uh, to run those searches. Uh, we also contacted leader researchers in the field and asked them to provide published and unpublished studies on the topic. Uh, we also screened reference lists of the included studies, previously published systematic reviews on similar topics uh, based on, well, focused on risk protective factors for radicalization. Then there were specific inclusion and exclusion criteria. So basically in this systematic review, we included published and unpublished quantitative studies that focused on family related risk and protective factors for radicalization, the impact of radicalization on families and family focused interventions. Uh, at the beginning, we wanted to include quant qualitative studies as well, because of course they are important. Uh, but we realized that their methodologies are quite different from what we were trying to uh, include among the quantitative studies. So we thought that probably there should be another systematic review, hopefully in future, that would focus on qualitative research. But in this case, we wanted to know what quantitative studies are out there. Uh, then we included any study year, location, or any demographic characteristics of the participants. So there were no limitations uh, regarding this demographic uh, variables. Then another inclusion criteria is that, uh, Mm, that, that mm, the relation between family related factors and radicalization was measured uh, and or that there was uh, that there was a family focused intervention against radicalization so there were some studies that would talk that would write about those relations but they were not actually measured so if they were not measured they had to be excluded so when we had a measure of this relationship uh, we could include a study uh, then for family related risk and protective factors, radicalized individuals needed to be compared to general population, uh, or there was a correlation also, uh, but there were some studies that, for example, compared uh, radicalized terrorists uh, with other murderers. So, for example, these studies were excluded because there was no general population or studies that um, would compare radicalized individuals and individuals who were even more radicalized, right? So, we're like two groups of radicals. So, these studies were also excluded. And then we had this definition of radicalization. So, radicalization had to be defined as support or commission of violence to defend a cause. Uh, 
which included support for radical groups. Uh, because there were several studies that defined radicalization in a, in a different way, which was not actually defending the cause uh, through violence. So for example, there were studies that uh, focus on racism or on racist act attitudes, but without this violent component. So these studies were excluded, for example, or other studies that would even um, think of of, of radicalization as a proxy of, for example, being a rebel in the 70s. Um, so there were items such as not wearing a bra in the 70s. And the people who, women who stated that they were not wearing a bra were considered a bit rebel. Uh, so this would basically mean, if we included those studies, that this would basically mean that we would be putting apples and oranges together and we didn't want to do this. So studies that didn't explicitly measure violence to defend the cause were excluded. So for the data collection, we scanned a lot of studies. Yes, yeah, so it was so we located through our searches, we located over 86,000 studies. Uh, but after titles and abstract screening, uh, we retained 284 full texts. Uh, and then we, uh, from those full texts, we located 33 studies that were included in our meta-analysis, uh, in our systematic review, sorry, and 30 of them were included in the meta-analysis because three didn't provide enough data to transform the effect sizes. Uh, so we were not able to include them. And I think it's important to mention that at all these stages, we did this together. So my co-author, Elena Nasajewsku and myself, uh, we're um, actually working on each and every stage of the systematic review independently. Uh, then we would uh, calculate agreement rates uh, and discuss all possible disagreements. Our agreement rates are very high in this case, uh, but we would do this separately to make sure that we wouldn't miss any studies and hopefully we, we, we didn't. Uh, so yes, yeah, so each one of us would screen all those 80, would run searches independently, then screen all those 86,000 studies, then 284 full texts, and then 33 studies. So it was a lot of work, but I think it, it was worth it. So among the included studies, we included 33, as I said, and all of those studies focused on family uh, related risk and protective factors. So we actually didn't find any studies on consequences of radicalization for families, or we didn't find any studies on interventions, any studies that would uh, be included according to our inclusion and exclusion criteria. Uh, to be honest, there were several, there were many studies uh, that were qualitative. So those qualitative studies could be synthesized in another systematic review. But among the studies that would um, be in agreement with our inclusion and exclusion criteria, all focused on family-related risk and protective factors. And those studies would report 83 primary effect sizes. So effect size, primary effect sizes mm, basically mean statistical comparison, statistical relation uh, between a family factor and uh, radicalization. And these, uh, these statistics would focus on 48 different variables, which were grouped by us into 14 factors. These 14 factors were uh, grouped based on an analysis of these variables, and we tried to make these uh, groups of factors as meaningful as possible, as I said, no, trying not to put apples and oranges together. Uh, and this is absolutely explicit. So if any of the participants would like to read the report, and I hope you do, and it's published as a Campbell, Campbell uh, report, a Campbell um, paper. Uh, I think uh, and any, any reader can actually get familiar with the way in which we grouped those factors. And then there are specific and separately uh, calculated effect sizes for each variable as well. So readers can actually get familiar with effect sizes for variables and then for factors. And among those factors, these are the groups of factors that we established. So 
Uh, these factors were critical family events such as divorce, death, and similar. Then having extremist family members. Uh, we also had family commitment, so it's importance and involvement of families. Uh, family conflict, so parents, conflicts with parents, conflicts with other family members. Family size, so having children or um, reporting bigger family size. Mostly it was having children, but also sometimes uh, questions were asked about how many family members do you have. Uh, then family social economic status. So we put this, um, standard social economic uh, status indicators such as level of education, level of poverty and similar. Family violence. So this was violence from parents to children, also violence among parents or among children. Having an immigrant spouse. There was one study that, the study that focused on, on that. Uh, then mar marital status, so being married, not being single which is not exactly the same, but we transformed those, those effect sizes. Uh, then parental control, so control, being in control, not being permissive. And then there was a study about parental elbow mentality. So it's basically trying to achieve goals, even uh, with some means that are not very prosocial, to put it this way. Then parental politics communication. So these studies focused on parents talking about politics with children, uh, having a religious household, uh, and parental ethnic socialis socialization. So this basically focused on bias towards other ethical, uh, ethnic groups, uh, ethnic, ethnic groups, or mistrust uh, towards these groups. And regarding, regarding the number of studies per included year, I think it's in interesting to see that the number of studies are actually uh, growing. So uh, we included some studies from the 80s, then some recent studies, um, and we have uh, we, we can see here that uh, the number of studies uh, on the topic is increasing, which is, I think, good news. So uh, regarding the relation between uh, each family factor and radicalization, uh, we can see on the screen the overall effect sizes. Uh, so as can be seen here uh, in red are the significant risk factors and uh, significant protective factors are marked in green. Uh, so the overall for overall radicalization, uh, risk factors were undesirable ethnic socialization having an extremist family member and family conflict. Whereas protective factors were higher family socioeconomic status, higher family size and higher family commitment. Then for cognitive radicalization, which is radicalization of thought, a radicalization that is mostly supporting violence but not actually perpetrating violence. Uh, so for cognitive radicalization, uh, we found undesirable ethnic, uh, again, socialization, family violence, and family conflict as risk factors. Uh, then protective factors were higher family size, higher family commitment, and higher parental control. Uh, regarding behavioral radicalization, so uh, again, behavioral radicalization is uh, informing of having perpetrated uh, acts of violence to defend the cause. Uh, risk factors were extremist family members, uh, critical family events, so these were basically family death, family divorce, and so on. Uh, and protective factors, again, were uh, higher family socioeconomic status and family commitment. Then regarding different ideologies, uh, for Islamist radicalization, we found risk factors such as family violence and family conflict. Uh, and we found only one significant protective factor, which was family socioeconomic status. For left wing radicalization, risk factors were family conflict, violence, and critical family events. Whereas protective factors were higher family socioeconomic status, 
family commitment and parental control. Uh, regarding the relation between each family factor and right wing radicalization, risk factors were extremist family member, uh, having family conflicts and violence, whereas protective factors were family socioeconomic status, family commitment, and parental control. All right, so we did find several risk and protective factors. I think that results are quite interesting. Uh, but of course, it's also important to evaluate the quality of the included studies. Uh, and there is um, an important section of our systematic review that can be read by the participants that focuses on, quality, on the quality of our included studies. So I think it should be taken into account that none of the located studies focused on family-related consequences of radicalization or family interventions, because none of them met the inclusion criteria of this current systematic review. Um, and basically, this is one important limitation. So we hope that future uh, studies would uh, be conducted um, and that could be uh, included in future systematic reviews. Then regarding risk and protective factors, the number of included studies was high enough to conduct a high quality systematic review and meta-analysis, but I think it's important to consider that factors were heterogeneous, which means that the number of studies included in each category was relatively low. So as you have seen on the screen, we did find several risk and protective factors, but most of them were based on um, a low number of studies. But the good news is that there was no evidence of publication bias. We also tested the possible publication bias and we found no evidence in most of the meta-analysis run in this study. Uh, because the study, <clears throat> well, I should have mentioned that when we uh, categorized uh, factors in uh, those uh, meaningful uh, categories, we run uh, meta-analysis for each and every uh, category, right? So there are several meta-analysis, not just one, but several depending on the category. And most of them didn't find evidence of bias. Then we also applied the, Campbell, uh, the Cambridge uh, quality checklist and none of the included studies showed causal relations between family factors and radicalization. This is also important. So none of them met the quality criteria to be considered causal. So we do not really know if those factors are causes, just correlates, maybe even consequences. They were conceptualized as risk and protective factors. Uh, then several studies were scored as relatively high on quality criteria for correlates and risk and protective factors. Uh, but as I said, none of them could be considered causal. And many other studies were scored as relatively low also on those quality criteria. Uh, and the, the, those quality criteria, of course, interested readers can, can check uh, the Cambridge quality checklist and our paper, but they mostly focus on the way in which participants are recruited. Um, so it's important that uh, samples are represented, they're big enough, uh, that there is no important attrition or the response rate is, is relatively high and that um, mm, constructs are measured with uh, validated instruments among other possible criteria. Uh, so the good news is also that in most of the studies, samples are relatively large. Uh, participants are selected at random in many studies, and it was possible to collect the data from several representative samples. Uh, but unfortunately, high quality validated instruments were rarely used. Uh, and the highest quality study uh, was conducted by Nivet and colleagues. So regarding the findings to sum up, I would say that some of those findings show some relatively robust risk and protective factors, even with those limitation, limitations. I, um, based on six studies, uh, high family socioeconomic status was a protective factor against right-wing, left-wing, and Islamist radicalization. 
Although I think it's important to acknowledge that effect sizes were rather small, uh, and most of the, I mean, in this case, all the included studies were rated as low quality. Uh, also, there was no relation uh, of uh, social economic status to behavioral radicalization, but it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It just means that uh, maybe there were not enough studies to show it. Then based on four studies, family conflict was a risk factor for right wing and left wing and Islamist radicalization. But in this case, only cognitive radicalization was studied. So we don't know if it is a risk factor indeed for behavioral radicalization. And studies were not of a very, very high quality based on the criteria that I have mentioned before. Uh, then, based on five studies, parental control was related to less cognitive radicalization, but again, effect sizes uh, were rather small and based mostly on lower quality studies. Then family commitment was maybe the most robust protective factors. It was, factor. It was based on 10 studies, but the effect sizes were rather small again, and all but one studies were rated as lower quality. It was also protective against left-wing and right-wing radicalization, but it was only in Western countries, basically because uh, the number of studies in other countries was not high enough to, to, to show if there was evidence, if there was a relation, sorry. So even uh, with some limitations and some, I think, interesting findings, I think there are important implications for policy and practice. So although causal relations between family-related risk and protective factors cannot be established based on our systematic review, I think it's reasonable to suggest that policies and practice should aim at decreasing family-related risk and protective factors. Uh, so, so basically risks should be decreased and protective factors should be increased because we did find evidence of uh, the importance of family related risk and protective factors. So what are the most important policy recommendations and practice recommendations? Uh, although only based on one study, I think it's important to think that parental ethnic socializ socialization that was found to be related to more radicalization should be improved. So decreasing bias against other cultures and ethnicities, teaching about different cultures and teaching that people are all equal would be desirable. Then it would also be desirable to counter extremism in families. Although only based on two studies, uh, our findings show that having extremist family members was related to more radicalization. So it would be desirable to counter radicalization and extremism in families, not only in individuals. Then it would be important to decrease family conflict. So based on four studies, family conflict was related to more radicalization. Thus families could benefit from acquiring some skills for desirable conflict resolution. Then regarding socioeconomic status, it would be important to increase education and decrease poverty. So based on six studies, having high family socioeconomic status was related to less radicalization. And it could be uh, important to increase education, decrease poverty, and decrease social inequalities. Then it would be important also to understand the relation between family size and radicalization. We have found that bigger family size was related to less radicalization, and, this, and it was based on three studies. So we think that it could be mostly driven by having children. So basically bigger family size would usually mean having children, which could be a sign of good social functioning for some people, probably not for other people. But more research is needed to understand this relation. Then family commitment uh, was a protective factor. So it was based on 10 studies. Uh, and um, thus we believe that parental involvement, cohesion, care and importance could be desirable to decrease radicalization. Then it is absolutely crucial to design and evaluate family-based interventions. We have seen that some factors are really promising but we know that family-based interventions with high quality 
effectiveness still need to be conducted uh, or at least evaluated. There are some programs, as I said, that we located in our searches, but they were not quantita quantitatively evaluated. So we believe that this should be done. Uh, and they could be a promising way to decrease radicalization, but empirical evidence is urgently needed. Then it would be important to conduct more high quality studies on risk and protective factors. We have seen that we do have some promising results, uh, but longitudinal prospective studies with representative samples, high quality instruments and low attrition rates are urgently needed. We need more evidence. We see from our results that this research line is really promising, but we need more evidence. And then randomized controlled trials and studies that control for confounding variables before the risk factors are measured are highly desirable because these kinds of studies could potentially uh, show some causal uh, relations between family factors and later radicalization. Uh, then it's also important to describe the impact of radicalization on families. There are reasons to believe that radicalization has serious detrimental consequences for families, but our systematic review did not locate any studies on that topic, on that topic at least um, studies that would meet our inclusion and exclusion criteria. So consequences should definitely be described in future high quality studies. So, this is the list of the most important um, implications for policy and practice. So again, decreased bias amongst minor among, uh, against minorities, counter extremism in families, decreased family conflict, increased education and decreased poverty, understand the relation between family size and radicalization, promote family commitment, design and evaluate family-based interventions, conduct more research, quality studies on risk and protective factors, and describe the impact of radicalization on families. So thank you very much for your attention and for being here. Uh, I should have probably said that questions can be placed in a chat box. So we do have a chat box. Uh, I am very, very happy to take questions now and also through email. So I think I will show my screen again. So attendance can, yeah. So uh, my, oh, I think I haven't put my email address here, have I? Uh, yes, yeah. So uh, I am very happy to take question through, questions through email and here. Uh, if any of the attendants uh, would like to, put questions in the chat box. You're more than welcome to do that. Uh, and you can also get, get unmuted um, and ask questions directly. Uh, so please just let us know if you have any questions and you can get unmuted. Uh, you can also turn on your camera if you, if you wish. So not sure if there are any questions, comments. Comments are also more, more than welcome. Hi, hi, it's Buzz Howard White from Campbell. So thanks, that was a really interesting presentation. It was, it was, it was great. There's a couple of things I, I'm, I'm maybe a bit less comfortable and I'd, I'd appreciate your views on it. We, we tend to try and say qual, um, confidence study findings rather than quality because authors don't like being told their studies are low quality, it's one thing, but also, it doesn't necessarily capture what we're trying to necessarily get. So, for example, we've done work on homelessness where attrition is just really high, particularly for comparison groups. And so, um, it's, I mean, I've seen, remember one study in particular where they had power calculation based on attrition of 50%, which is you know, pretty high, but it turned out to be 80%. So, in the end, you can't have much confidence study findings, but it really wasn't their fault. They're the best they could. So, to say it's low quality is a bit like, you know, damning them when they don't deserve damning. Where do we say, but unfortunately, we have low competence study findings because we didn't um, do that. It's a similar thing with blinding, you know, I, the failure to blind. When I started in this area, I was of the view that many people have, well, you can't blind with these interventions, so you shouldn't mark them down for that. But the fact is, blinding does cause bias, failure to blind does cause bias. And so 
it does reduce confidence study findings. I think if you, if you, if you phrase it that way, then you're less likely to have you know, people coming down and say, okay, I don't like it, but I understand where you're coming from. Well, I'm saying low quality. Then people go, I don't, you know, I don't, don't, don't agree. So maybe that's a comment rather than a question. The question is, as you, you said, and I mean, it's not surprising, these are correlational studies, not uh, attribution studies. We're looking at a causal effect. But in principle, there are designs. Um, one would have thought, I mean, non experimental designs like propensity score matching. Well, you might think, okay, we can't get rid of all of these selection observables, but you can you can get rid of some of it. Uh, are there no studies like that? Isn't that a possible area for future research? Oh, well, thank you very much for your comments and questions. I think they are absolutely excellent. So yeah, I do agree with your point. And actually in our systematic review, we used terminology that would be lower and higher quality studies. Right. We do not really call them low quality. We just divided them into lower and higher. Right. And we also ran some moderation analysis. And yes, and I think this is also why running systematic reviews and meta-analysis is so important because Empirical research has limitations. And of course, we have limitations oh. regarding funding. So it's not that we really conduct low quality studies. It's just that we do uh, our best to collect the best oh. evidence possible. And then systematic reviews, including Cam Campbell reviews, which are, I think top quality reviews are really good for that. So we can see limitations and we can sort of overcome many of those limitations that are present in empirical research. So thank you for that comment and I definitely mm -hmm. agree with you. And then regarding uh, this possible methodologies, yes, and I think um, they could be very useful. So propensity score matching or even um, some even some regression analysis could mm -hmm. potentially be, be fine or maybe some cross lag panel models where we can right. take directional hypothesis, but this hasn't been done yet. Okay. So I think it's very important to promote this kind of research. I'm not sure if any policy makers or uh, foundations uh, are watching us, hopefully yes. So we need funding for that because those, those studies are, are expensive. Most of them, I mean, all of them would need to be longitudinal or experimental. Mm. Those studies are, are, are expensive, uh, but I think it's really worth it. So we should, we should conduct those studies, yes, um, but of course we need funding for them. Okay, so. thank you. So <laughs> this actually, is a call, there's, there's, a call there's, for there's, there's one yeah. funder here. I don't want to put on the spot particularly, but I am. So Jihan from BSC is here. Um, Jihan, is there anything you want to say about that and possibility <laughs> of being something where primary studies might be funded? Good morning, everyone. <laughs> At least it's in Montreal. It's uh, 7.52 a.m. I'm yeah. just a person today. I'm just observing. Okay. <laughs> All right, Thank so I don't you. want to put on the spot particularly. Okay. I did say there's a question in the chat. Isabel, if you can yes. have a look at that. So there is a question. So it says, you mentioned that doing Campbell review is great because of high standards. Can you let us know what difference do you think is made registering with Campbell? Oh, it is a big difference, basically. So it is really a long story. I uh, think the, the, good, the, the best idea is just to check Campbell um, um, website. Uh, there is this whole process um, that uh, that needs to be followed to register, register a review. And I think that documentation available at the Campbell website is really good. But just to mention some important, um, important steps that need to be taken for a Campbell review. Uh, well, first of all, um, it's, it's a controlled process at different stages. So first, a title is registered. So, uh, editors and reviewers would check the title, the idea, and would give you feedback on if this is really important, what else should be taken into account, and so on. Then there is a protocol, uh, which involves a lot of thinking and establishing uh, a clear methodology and explaining why this review is important and how it is going to be conducted. Again, uh, feedback is received from reviewers and editors. So if there are any problems with methodology, 
they will help you. They will let you know, oh, this is good. This is not that good. This should be changed. And this is really important because one feels really confident when conducting such a review. So before uh, the actual review starts, there is this established methodology and it's known what needs to be done. And then again, the review is conducted and with all those standards, with all mm. those established criteria, um, again, reviewed by editors, peer reviewers and feedback is provided. Um, then there are some quality standards that need to be followed. So these are established. There is this specific checklist uh, for what needs to be done in a high quality systematic review. So uh, one has to follow those standards, we have to get, get, get familiar with this and then just, just do that. If you haven't done it, again, reviewers will go back. It, reviews would, 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 would be received by you and you, you would be told, oh, you have to change this and this and this. So it's again, uh, according to Canvas quality. Uh, yeah, and um, this is basically it. And then of course there is this uh, quality checklist. Uh, so studies need to be checked for their quality. Uh, it needs to be explicitly reported. Um, and there are all the important steps that need to be taken. So, and, and yeah, and, 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 and then it's, it's published in Campbell uh, Journal, which is also very good because it's a, it's a journal that reaches a lot of people. So I think uh, it's, it's, it's fantastic to, to, to register with Campbell. Okay, so I think there is one more question. It says, this is very interesting. Thank you very much. Uh, can you please tell us about the, your theory of change? Were you able to test any family social crime related theories? Well, I wouldn't say we were able to test those theories, to be honest, uh, because um, we haven't found many studies on change. It would be highly desirable, as mentioned before, to include some studies that focus on change and see if these risk and protective factors, uh, if change in these factors would lead to change in uh, radicalization, in problem behaviors related to uh, radicalization in this case. So what is a theory of change? When in, when in this case, I wouldn't feel confident to build a theory on our findings, I would just say that probably decreasing risks and increasing protective factors is useful. So this is what I think should be done next. I would say that uh, programs uh, should probably focus on risk and protective factors that are known and then just check if uh, if, if they work, and if they don't, then they should be modified. Uh, and as I said, new research is also needed for that. And so, yeah, and probably regarding theories, and, well, those theories that were uh, presented at the beginning, I would say social learning is important, uh, also group influence over individual behavior. Um, parenting styles are important, so I think improving parenting would also be important, especially family commitment. Um, then I would also say that providing social structures, so social capital uh, that promotes desirable behavior would probably be protective against radicalization. But again, uh, regarding change, I think uh, more needs to be done to, to be able to, to state how change could be possible based on evidence. So I think our time is mostly over. Not sure if anyone has any other comments, questions. You can get unmuted if you want. You cannot maybe, I'm not sure if uh, any other person wants to add anything to that. Uh, oh yeah, I have one. I We'll take just one more question. Okay, so here it is. It says, according to your Prisma, a vast majority of the studies were excluded in the title and abstract screening stage. Can you please tell us what led to this? Yes, so most of our, most, most of the located studies were not really relevant to our topic. Uh, so just to put it simply, I 
I would say that we found a lot of studies, for example, from chemistry, because in chemistry, they focus on families of radicals. So there were several, many, many studies that would include radicals from, from chemistry, for example, and family uh, in titles and abstracts. So these were not relevant at all. Um, so it was, it was quite easy to screen those studies, right? Just to give you one example. And then there were other studies that uh, were, uh, for example, qualitative, and it was uh, absolutely clear from uh, titles and abstracts because it was explicitly stated. Uh, then there were some studies that were just like narrative reviews, some essays, opinions. So this was also clear from titles and abstracts. So I would say that that's basically it. Uh, whenever it was not clear, we would keep the study just in case, right? So some studies, uh, whenever we had some doubts, we would keep the study for full text screening and to be to be sure that um, that uh, nothing relevant was was missed. All right, so I think it's already well depends where, but I think we've already been here for one hour. Not sure. If I, maybe I can take any like one more comment if you if any of you have any other comments. Or... Thank you for a great presentation. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you very much. So thank you for having me. A uh, big thank you to Campbell, to the Department of Homeland Security also for funding our study, to the reviewers, to editors of Campbell Journal, uh, also to researchers who provided um, some uh, references for our study, because as I said, we contacted many researchers in the field and they were all very helpful. So thank you very much for everybody who made this possible. And of course, a special thank you to my co-author, Elena Nasaescu. As I said, this systematic review is authored by the two of us. So also a big thank you to, to Elena and to everybody who is present here and everybody who will watch this afterwards. Thank you.